let's begin by um, having a look at our conceptual model of what an early protocell looks like. Uh, so again, we think of a protocell as having two parts, uh, a, a membrane boundary uh, that uh, closes up into uh, a spherical uh, vesicle uh, that can encapsulate uh, molecules in the internal aqueous compartment. And the most important of those would be uh, genetic mo molecules, uh, possibly RNA or DNA or maybe some related kind of uh, nucleic acid. And uh, what we would like to understand is how, in the absence of highly evolved genetic material, uh, this membrane compartment could first uh, grow and subsequently uh, divide into daughter cells. Okay, and because we're thinking about this in, at a very early time, uh, prior to the emergence of Darwinian evolution and advanced highly evolved cellular machinery, we have to look uh, to simple chemical and physical processes to drive these transformations. Okay, so uh, to think about that, we need to think about the molecules that are going to be used to build these membranes. And our favorite molecules in this regard are the fatty acids. Uh, so these range from short chain uh, saturated fatty acids like capric acid, which are the kinds of molecules that we think could have been easily made in different scenarios on the early earth. Uh, many times in our laboratory work, we use uh, more modern fatty acids, meristoleic acid or oleic acid, uh, simply for convenience. Uh, but in the end, we always come back uh, to more prebiotically reasonable uh, systems. We got into this area about 10 years ago and started doing uh, some very simple experiments uh, based on uh, the pioneering work of people like Dave Diemer and Pierluigi Luisi. Now, the Luisi lab in particular had shown already that you can uh, make vesicles grow simply by adding more fatty acids in the form of alkaline micelles. When the micelles go into a buffered solution, they become a thermodynamically unstable phase. So there's an energetic driving force for those molecules to assemble into either new membranes or to integrate into pre-existing membranes. And uh, at the time, uh, Marty Hanchik was a postdoc in the lab, Shelley Fujikawa was a student. Um, they basically uh, repeated those experiments but using uh, real-time methods of analysis so that we could watch the process of vesicle growth in real time after the addition of food molecules. The assay that we used was a, a fluorescence assay based on energy transfer from donor uh, to acceptor dyes. It's basically a measure of how far apart the dyes are on average. And as the membrane grows by incorporating new molecules, the dyes are diluted, they get further apart, and energy transfer efficiency decreases. So you can use this as a very effective assay for surface area in real time. So we can watch uh, things grow uh, very easily by the simple fluorescence assay. The uh, uh, first advance uh, in this area uh, came from thinking about uh, an alternative growth pathway. And so this is a pathway of growth that instead of relying on the environmental influx of, of new molecules, uh, occurs in a different way by competition uh, between uh, uh, protocells in a population. So some are gonna grow at the expense of others. And this was work uh, done by Irene Chen when she was a student in my lab and initiated by discussions with Rich Roberts when he was a postdoc in the lab. So the basic idea was uh, that if you think of our basic uh, protocell model, we have genetic molecules trapped inside a semi-permeable membrane. Now, large polymers contribute very little to the overall internal osmotic pressure in a system like this. Most of the osmotic pressure actually results from uh, counter ions that have to be there to neutralize the charge on the polyanionic genetic molecule. And so this is the classical Donin effect. 
uh, these ions contribute to an internal osmotic pressure. And we thought that as a result of this physical phenomenon, this physical effect, vesicles that had more RNA inside them should have a higher osmotic pressure, and maybe that could actually drive growth competitively. So um, the way that we looked at that experimentally was uh, using the same fluorescence assay that we had been using before to monitor uh, membrane growth following the addition of new membrane molecules. But in, in, in this case, the idea is that we're going to take osmotically swollen vesicles that have, for example, a lot of RNA inside, and we'll monitor the, the surface area uh, of those vesicles uh, following mixing with uh, vesicles that are osmotically relaxed. And we'll ask what happens to the surface area. Okay. So, uh, so here's the experiment where we're uh, monitoring the surface area of the swollen vesicles. These are vesicles that have a lot of RNA on the inside. Uh, and by themselves, they're perfectly stable. Nothing happens. Same thing for the relaxed vesicles. Nothing happens. As soon as you mix the swollen vesicles with relaxed vesicles, you can see that their surface area uh, starts to increase uh, over a period of minutes. And in control experiments where we mix with buffer or other swollen vesicles, there's very little change. Okay, so it seems like the swollen vesicles are growing by uh, absorbing molecules from their relaxed neighbors. We can, of course, do the converse experiment and monitor the surface area of the relaxed vesicles uh, 